Welcome to another edition of 15 Minutes of Flame. I am Robert Phoenix, broadcasting to you live from South Central Texas, where we started off with wonderfully sunny skies, which were the byproduct of a late night storm. And here we are once again, staring out into the gunmetal gray atmosphere. The weather has officially become high strange and duly uh, modulated and modified by the weather gods of this planet. How is everybody today? Today's uh, June 1st. Uh, the world is supposed to be ending today, and we could probably look at some astrology around that. Why don't we just do that? Why don't we just check in with astrology real quickly, which is part of the new practice here for the 15 minutes of flame experience. So we're just going to go over usually the first three planets, Sun, Moon, Mercury, to give us an understanding of the energy of the day, the relationship energy, communication energy, so on, so on, and so on. So today we have an exact square between the Sun and the Moon, the Sun in Gemini, and the Moon in Virgo. We're talking mutable square, which means that you can change the energy. It's not fixed and feeling like you're stuck. Uh, this could be a very good day for course correction, but one of the things that you have to watch out for is being too critical of yourself or others. That Virgo moon is harsh. I grew up with two parents that have Virgo moons, and uh, let's just put it this way. There is plenty of criticism to go around in the family for all three of us. So today, uh, if you want to be very clear about your emotional state, that's fine. Uh, just be, don't, don't be too critical of it with yourself or others. Uh, there's, it's a heady energy. You know, both uh, Gemini and Virgo are ruled by Mercury, theoretically, even though I have another ruler set aside for Virgo. But that's for another day, another time. And then we have Mercury in Taurus. Now, as we progress through the day and we get into the nighttime hours and early morning hours, uh, the moon will actually wind up in trine with Mercury, and communication will go a bit easier. It's a wide trine right now, about 9 degrees. So if you really have something you want to share, if you really have something you want to get off your chest, I'd say wait till a little bit later in the day. Now, Venus is at 25 degrees and it's getting really close to Uranus, which is at 27. So we could be witnessing some really explosive and dramatic and radical shifts in relationship over the course of the next two days. Not necessarily today, although that conjunction is getting pretty darn close within two degrees. Uh, Mars is hanging out at 27 Gemini, and uh, it is... Mm, in sextile with Venus and in sextile with Uranus. This is volatile energy. And we're coming up on Donald Trump's birthday. How about, how about that? Trump, of course, making waves with his new word that he created, Kavefe, whatever Kavefe is. Is it coffee? I don't know. Uh, the most interesting presidency we've ever had. And not always in a good way. Uh, meanwhile, on the Trump tip, there were about four people that went to go investigate Ivanka Trump's shoe factory in China, and uh, two of the four are missing or detained. I guess you don't mess around with the Donald and his daughter when it comes to trying to figure out the gross injustice and slave wage practices that are being overseen in China for the uh, Trump family, getting all those wonderful Ivanka-styled products. Not good. Trump himself has been granted 20 new uh, trademarks in China. That's right, while well, he's president. At some point, the emollients claim should come into play here and could easily be the plank in which Trump could be impeached. But when we look at the uh, media, circus, we never hear the word emollients. I mean, we heard it kind of early on, but it's sort of dropped by the wayside. In any case, uh, another person who's profited off of the relationship with China has been the Kushners, 
who've been trying to sell green cards to very wealthy Chinese investors who want to come to the United States. So while Trump has uh, declared China was a trade uh, enemy, it was a partner that was not living up to its end of the deals. That criticism has rapidly gone away, and what we've seen is nothing but profit and gain from the relationship with China. Meanwhile, Trump's taking on Germany and uh, doing everything he can to disassemble the relationship with the United States and Western Europe, which I don't think is necessarily a bad thing, to be honest with you. I mean, you know, the, it's like their issues and the EU and the sort of the global platform that they're creating really has very little to do with us. And their insane policies around refugees uh, should really not be part of our policy moving forward, although it doesn't seem like Trump is going to stem the tide anytime soon. Anyway, that's your Trump update for today. Let's talk a little bit about yesterday's show, and then we're going to get into this uh, stuff around Stanford that I've been kicking around since, well, yesterday's show. Uh, I read a piece by Alfred Weber, Alfred Labramont Weber, and he really went after uh, Yurka Rivse from Gaia. Now, Yurka doesn't need my help. He doesn't need me to stand up for him, <laughs> trust me. This guy, this guy is filthy rich. He's got plenty of lawyers, and he doesn't give a shit what Alfred Weber says. But in order to keep the record straight and clear, Alfred said that Yurka was a Polish Satanist, and he had ties to the Polish Satanists who killed Max Spears. Well, it turns out that Yurka is actually Czech. So maybe Alfred should do a fact check before he uh, uses a blowtorch to Yurka, and he better be he better be careful. Yurka is is not a uh, he's not a wallflower, and Alfred may be backed by you know these international forces that he seems to have some kind of cookie crumb connection with. Right, breadcrumb connection. He's got. He's got. I mean, he's got connections to the UN, and he's got. A, you know, he's a lawyer. He's. He's. And how does Alfred make money doing his thing? That's the other thing I've wondered about. You know, anytime any, any you see anybody involved in the truth world, or they're trying to, you know, expurgate these hidden and and, and uh, occluded and occulted mysteries, it's like where do they get their money? Especially the older, the older guys, right? And if there's no real, again, trail with how they make their money, how they're supported, then you have to wonder if they're being supported by somebody else. And I'm not saying that that's what's happening with Alfred, but I just, I've always wondered about that. Anyway, I just wanted to keep the record straight about his assertions around Yurka. They're wrong. He's not Polish. He's Czech. Thank you, Annette, for bringing that to my attention. So one of the things we got into yesterday was this connection with Stanford. And somebody had texted me something about Esalon, which I had been to, by the way. And Esalon is kind of a, it's kind of a paradise, to be honest with you. I mean, it's right there. It's in Big Sur. It's on the Pacific Coast. On a nice day, you, you just feel like you're, a million miles away from any place else. And you could be a million miles or a million years away from this time. A million years into the future, a million years into the past, it doesn't matter. You're not here now. This is what it feels like. You can get a massage right there on the on the uh, precipice of the Pacific Ocean. And just beautiful outdoor massage. And then after that's done, you can just mosey on down to the hot springs, which are right there in the rocks overlooking the Pacific Ocean. It's, it's magical, an absolutely magical place. So somebody asked me about uh, Esalon yesterday, and uh, I've been having a dialogue with Murray, who's been really great in terms of sending me some art stuff and, uh, you know, th throwing me a few tidbits here. And so he, he started this 
sort of search for me with Esalon and Stanford. So one of the things about Esalon that's fascinating, I'll give you a little bit of a history of Esalon. Uh, so this is from uh, Wikipedia, and uh, <clears throat> the Esalon Institute commonly just called Esalon is a nonprofit American retreat center and international community, I'm sorry, intentional community in Big Sur, which focuses on humanistic alternative education. The Institute played a key role in the human potential movement beginning in the 1960s, its innovative use of encounter groups, a focus on the mind-body connection and their ongoing experimentation of personal awareness introduced many ideas that later became mainstream. So what was happening at Esalon during that time is you had people like uh, Fritz Perls who was doing gestalt work and Gregory Bateson who was you know, sort of on the cutting edge of linguistics and social programming. Uh, Aldous Huxley was involved in the early days of Esalon. So this is an interesting uh, time in, in, in sort of this period where there's this explosion of consciousness ready to happen. Now, of course, it's being fueled by LSD, which also has a Stanford connection, and that's being created by the CIA, and Tim Leary, and Albert Hoffman. And so this is the fuel that's priming this kind of explosion of consciousness and pushing the parameters of human awareness, right? This is what was going on. Now, Stanford was founded by Michael Murphy and Dick Price. I'm, I'm sorry, Esalen, founded, founded by Stanford graduates, Michael Murphy and Dick Price. And uh, their intention was to support alternative methods for exploring human consciousness. Now, Michael Murphy had spent some time in India. He was a big fan of Sri Aurobindo, the mother, uh, and Sat, Sat Prem, uh, all very interesting people, very bright people, to be honest with you. And Aurobindo was looking into the link between humanity and supra-humanity and trying to understand the body and where the, where the hidden keys, where the mysteries to unlock human potential were inside the human body. So a lot of Aurobindo's work was along those lines. And Michael Murphy was also very invested in that kind of research and wound up taking that on uh, later in his life and created a massive book about the human body. So he's got the Eastern thing going on and uh, uh, Dick Price was kind of on the Western side. Uh, they, they were both involved in the psychology program and they, they were influenced by a lecture that Huxley gave in 1960 at Stanford called Human Potentialities. Then after they graduated from Stanford, Price went to Harvard and he continued to study psychology. And of course, uh, Michael Murphy ran off to India. Now here's where it gets really fascinating. So the, the property belonged to um, Murphy's family. So it, I believe it was owned by his grandmother. And they had a, a Pentecostal, rundown Pentecostal church on the property. And the baths were being occupied by a community of very rough gay men. And Hunter S. Thompson was there. He was he was he would guard the property with shotguns and it was a very strange scene. So this is really the genesis of Esalon. It comes together with this bizarre kind of, you know, hardcore gay community and Hunter S. Thompson being involved. And then here comes the Stanford contingency and there's this collision between the two. And eventually uh, Murphy winds up getting the lease to the property because of, I guess some violence went down there. So apparently, according to Wikipedia, Thompson attempted to visit the baths with friends and got into a fist fight when some of the gay men jumped him. The men almost tossed him over a cliff. Murphy's father, a lawyer, finally persuaded his mother to allow her grandson to take over. She agreed to lease the property to them in 1962. So this is where it changes hands. The two men used the capital that Price obtained from his father. Now, Dick Price's father was a vice president, Sears Roebuck. So these guys are, you know, fairly entitled. They're coming from money, 
So they got the dough from Dick Price's dad. They bought the property, and this is the genesis of Esalon. And then you have people like Fritz Perls coming in. Gestalt becomes um, very popular there. And then you had uh, people like George Leonard and Gregory Bateson and Robert Nadeau and you know, all these early people or people that were early on the tip of human potential. You know, just think of it. If you're a member of the CIA or one of the dark alphabets that we have very little knowledge of, wouldn't you want to go to Esalon? I mean, wouldn't you want to go and watch these encounter groups and watch people get split open like watermelons? I mean, this is, this is where it's ground zero for understanding human behavior and how human behavior can be modified and adjusted. So this went on for a very long time, and it still is going on. Dick Price's son, David, is the general manager of Esalon. He started in the mid-1990s. And it's a pretty cool place to hang out, but it, it clearly, 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 has plays a role as a psychic and social incubator for the new age. It's really almost ground zero for the new age, but there's more to Stanford and it, and it doesn't just rest in this kind of embryonic sort of moment where Price and Huxley create Esalon. There's more to Stanford because right around the same time that Price and Hux, uh, Price and, uh, and Murphy, I'm sorry, were creating Esalon. Something else was going on at Stanford. They were doing, re they were doing research into schizophrenia and LSD. Where were they getting the LSD from? Of course they were getting it from the CIA, who was cooking up batches like crazy. And there was a young ward who was going to Stanford and was working these shifts, studying psychology and medicine uh, at Stanford. And uh, there was a young ward who started to take the LSD home. I think he might have been taking it at Stanford. I have to go back and check my notes. But the young ward that was there was none other than Ken Kesey. So now you have Ken Kesey getting pure grade, 100% potent LSD cooked in CIA labs and consuming it and becoming the John the Baptist of the psychedelic revolution of the 1960s. And of course, out of this comes the new age and human potential. So it starts with Ken Kesey. And, and of course, Kesey moves to La Honda, which is where I lived for a couple of years. And that's where they have the first acid tests. And the early version of the Grateful Dead would come down and play and hang out. And they'd set up huge speakers and amplifiers and just, you know, go for it in this psychedelic Bacchanalian sort of frenzy, throwing off all the limits. And, of course, then we have the Merry Pranksters and the trip around the country with the bus named Further and Tom Wolfe on board chronicling the whole experience and Neil Cassidy driving the bus being the link between the beats and the hippies and Kesey goes full force until about I think 67 or so and then he becomes the uh, the creator of the human being which they still have they have the human being I think Michael Gosney is still doing that in San Francisco but it's this big 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 festival where all the <clears throat> all the uh, luminaries of the human potential movement, or which would become, a lot of them become uh, luminaries of the human potential movement, congregate in San Francisco for this major LSD blowout. And then right after that, Kesey gives it up. He realizes that the party has stopped and that he's seeing this infiltration of the system. The system is beginning to infiltrate the very thing that it helped create. So what does he do? He splits and he goes to Oregon and he becomes a dairy farmer and basically checks out. He writes his second book, Sometimes a Great Notion. He wrote um, 
moved over the cuckoo's nest earlier on. And after sometimes a great notion, I think he continued to write, but not to the same degree. Those two books were bestsellers, and uh, especially Cuckoo's Nest. So now we have Kesey and the Stanford Connection. We have Price Murphy, the Stanford Connection. We have Esalon and we have LSD. And how much more do you need to create a movement? Well, you, Tim Leary would help. And Tim Leary would eventually circulate from uh, Millbrook, or, uh, and he would um, uh, Millbrook, is it Millbrook? Uh, upstate New York, where they had the uh, where they had the, the the mansion, the psychedelic mansion. Anyway, he would come from upstate New York, and he would eventually wind up in Esalon and become part of the Esalon scene. So even Leary gets inserted, and he comes from Harvard, which is basically Stanford East. So this is this is the uh, Milford, I believe it is. This is this is the genesis. This is the genesis of the new age. And it's all happening. It's all exploding between 1960 and around 1965. And Stanford is ground zero for all of it. Now you would think, well, okay, well that's, that's it. It was just a massive explosion. It happened at a certain point in time. And there's more. There's actually quite a bit more. If we fast forward and we go to the 1970s, there are two projects at Stanford that really, again, kind of change the, change the course of things. Now, Stanford has always been home to the Hoover Institute, which theoretically is a conservative think tank. And this is where people like uh, George Schultz and Caspar Weinberger and all the guys that you know, spent time in the Reagan administration, that's where they hung out. They're part of the Hoover Institute, and their job is to help drive global policy. So that's always been in the background, right? So you have this sort of governmental think tank that's running parallel with these people that have been influenced and seeded and taking that influence and exploding it and bringing it to mass public consciousness. It's an interesting sort of uh, marriage, so to speak. Now, in the 1970s, this, and we're, we're actually moving towards like the late 1970s, a couple of interesting things happen at Stanford. They create something at SRI. Now, SRI is Stanford Research Institute, and Stanford Research Institute becomes an incubator. And one of the things that SRI created is something called VALS, V-A-L-S, which is Values and Lifestyles. And Values and Lifestyles is the proprietary research methodology that's used for psychographic market segmentation. Market segmentation is designed to guide companies in tailoring their products and services to appeal uh, to the people most likely to purchase them. Essentially, what psychographics is is it, it's the science of building a network of needs, wants, personal values, and lifestyle choices for every single individual. And based on those wants, needs, personal values, and lifestyle choices that are distilled for each individual, then retailers, producers of goods, possibly even presidential candidates, which we'll, which we'll see here soon, can then tailor their messaging, whether it's advertising, whether it's getting somebody to vote for them, directly to you. And psychographics, or vows, values, and lifestyles, has become a cornerstone for how to get into your head on the internet. Whether it's who you talk with on Facebook, whether it's the posts that you click on and like, whether it's the websites you go to, whether it's the products you buy on Amazon, who you talk to on your phone, the choices that you don't make, and as much as the choices that you do make, they're all compiled. They're all compiled. And for each and every one of us, there is a virtual straw man. And that virtual straw man can basically be used as a predictive model. And it's a predictive consumer model, but it can also be used as a predictive social model. So for instance, 
if something were to happen in a situation. Let's say the world goes to shit, and we're all scrambling around trying to, uh, you know, figure out what to do, how to do it, where to go, who to be with, all those things. Well, if there were persons of interest, they could they could literally look at these values and lifestyles, the psychographic blueprint and bullet points for who you are and predict what you will do. This is, this is why the, it's not just a commercial tool, but it is a kind of a socio-integrative tool so that you become a predictable entity. And they could, if you, if they so wanted to, they could look at your profile, look at where you are. They could look at parameters and say, well, they're going to do this, 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 and this. And in that, in that case, they become omniscient, right? They become like God. And they could insert people into your life. They could divert you from certain um, opportunities or routes. Now, I'm not being paranoid. I'm just telling you. That this is the power of technology and the power of information. And the most benign aspect is trying to figure out what you're going to buy. That's the most benign. And the most malefic is trying to figure out what you'll do in a crisis and an emergency. In which case, everything gets switched on. So let's go forward with VALS. VALS was developed in 1978 by social scientist and consumer futurist Arnold Mitchell and his colleagues at SRI International. It was immediately embraced by advertising agencies and is currently offered as a product of SRI's consulting services division, Psychographics. Vals draws heavily on the work of Harvard sociologist David Reisman and psychologist Abraham Maslow. Mitchell used statistics to identify attitudinal and demographic questions that helped adult American consumers into one of nine lifestyle types. Survivors, 4%. Sustainers, 7%. Belongers, 35%. Emulators, 9%. Achievers, 22%. I am me, 5%. Experiential, 7%. Socially, uh, societally conscious, 9%. And integrated, 2%. The questions were weighted using data developed from a sample of 1,635 Americans and their significant others who responded to an SRI survey in 1980. The main dimensions of the VALS framework are resources, the vertical dimension, and primary motivation, the horizontal dimension. So you have resources, vertical dimension, primary motivation, horizontal dimension. The vertical dimension segments people based on the degree in which they're innovative and have resources such as income, education, self-confidence, intelligence, leadership skills, and energy. Horizontal dimension represents primary motivations and include three distinct types. Here are the types. Consumers driven by knowledge and principles are motivated primarily by ideals. These consumer groups, uh, these consumers include groups called thinkers and believers. Consumers driven by demonstrating success to their peers are motivated primarily by achievement. These consumers include groups referred to as strivers or achievers. And then the third group is consumers driven for desire by desire for social or physical activity. Variety and risk taking are motivated primarily by self expression. These consumers include the groups known as experiencers and makers. At the top of the rectangle are the innovators who have such high resources that they could have any of the three primary motivations. At the bottom of the rectangle are the survivors who live complacently and within their means without strong primary motivation as the types listed above. The VALS framework gives more details about each group. So values and lifestyles came into significant play during the election of Ronald Reagan. And this is really the first time that a computerized sampling of the electorate takes place. And what SRI did is they took these punch cards and they sent them out to, I don't know, 5,000 people or 10,000 people. And they asked them to fill these punch cards out. And people love to do tests and you know, 
figure out, oh, I'm an ENFP and INFP, da 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 right? So they filled out these punch cards, and when the information came back and they collated it and they looked at all the variables, what they realized was that people basically wanted to be left alone, that they wanted to live their lives, that they wanted to use their income to fortify their lifestyle choices, many of which at that time seemed to be outside of the consumer realm, that they were not your typical consumers. They were not into consumption for the sake of consumption. So when the Reagan people got this information back, now remember the Hoover Institute and all those guys, Casper Weinberger and um, George Schultz and you know all those characters, when they were they they're right there at the Hoover Institute. So they're they're just a you know stone's throw from SRI. So they have they have the ability to capture this information. And then what they did is they began to tailor Reagan's campaign based on what they were getting back. And the messaging basically was, hey, we're going to leave you alone. We're going to let you do the best thing that you do, which is live your life. And we're going to govern at a kind of a light touch level. And we're going to free up resources for you to live your life, meaning that they would get into the uh, su supply side economic model, which would later become known as Reaganomics, which would free up capital for the upper 10 to 15% of these people that just wanted to have their lifestyle. And it worked perfectly. The electorate got it. And a lot of the people that voted for Reagan were people that were counterculture. They were counterculture. Believe it or not, the counterculture helped elect Ronald Reagan. And the reason why is because a lot of the counterculture people had acquired assets and money. And this is what happened with the sort of the baby boomers. They were the first at the table. Like, look at look at what happened here. Just just in a kind of a a, a slice with uh, Michael Murphy and Dick Price. They wanted to start an alternative kind of world and have their you know their dream academy. And they did it because Murphy's grandmother owned the land of Esalon. And, and, and you could do things like that back then. You know, I was talking with Steve Creamy on last week's show. I mean, you, people had the kind of this lateral ability to move and to create and to do something different because it, things weren't that expensive back in the 1960s. Yeah, people didn't have you know, a lot more money back then because wages were obviously lower but assets were lower too, much lower. Like try, try to find a piece of property on the California coast to create your dream academy now. It's going to cost you $15, $20 million if it's even available. And if it is, you probably have to buy it from somebody in Saudi Arabia or China perhaps. And again, I'm being a little over the top here, but that's true. It's a very, very different world. So the baby boomers had these assets at their disposal, which were really unlike assets at any other time in history. Not only were the assets there and available, but there was also some degrees of generational wealth. Because the one thing the baby boomers had, and I'm kind of at the tail end of the baby boomers, I'm in that weird in-between state. The one thing the baby boomers had that other generations didn't have because they had families. You get into the 1970s and all of a sudden, boom, we're in Pluto and Libra and everything is going to hell in a handbasket. The sexual revolution comes into play. We have the pill. People are screwing around. Um, men have midlife crises. You know, there's all sorts of memes floating around in the atmosphere. And uh, we have the explosion of the nuclear family. And what happens when the nuclear family gets exploded? There's less assets. That's the bottom line. There's less assets. Because you have one person that gets some degree of assets, another person has to give up the assets. In some cases, that doesn't always take place. Of course, there's, there's exceptions to the rule, but by and large, this is what happens. So now there's less money. There's less money. There's less generational money. And you just move that forward, and you go right into 
the Pluto and Scorpio generation where divorce is like what, 55%, 60%. And there's even, le there's even fewer assets. And people are, you know, scrambling and holding on to what they have. It's because you don't have two people pulling together generally to create wealth. And the wealth that's created is inflationary wealth now. So I'm just bringing all this up because these people in the 1960s could do these things. They, they had that, right? And so when they had that money, when they came through the counterculture, they're like, well, we need to invest that money. We need to buy land. We need to buy property. And this is where Reagan comes into play and says, hey, look, we're going we're gonna to let you keep your money. And we're going to let you live your life. So that, and we're going to stay out of the way. And we're not going to govern a whole lot. You know? In fact, we're going to do our best to deregulate as much as possible. And this came, this all came through the values and lifestyle punch cards. And people responded. People responded to Reagan's messaging. And you know, there's a great hue and cry amongst the um, the left and the liberals. So how could this happen? How could this happen? You know, Reagan is a uh, he's a he's a, a staunch conservative and on and on and on and on. But Reagan was an Aquarius. You know, from an astrological perspective, he appealed to a large group of people. He was called the great communicator. Now, clearly, there's a Reagan 1.0 and a Reagan 2.0. And the Reagan 1.0 exists before he gets hit, before he gets shot. Could you imagine today, like, Trump getting shot or Obama getting shot? I mean, Reagan got shot. And there are people who think that actually Reagan died. And he was replaced by a clone. And I don't have a problem with that, by the way. I don't have a problem with that. But clearly, there's a the messaging before he gets shot and the messaging after he gets shot is quite different. Okay, so we have we have values and lifestyles and the science known as demographics. Where does it come out of? It comes out of Stanford, SRI. Right around the same time, the United States government. Which is a little bit later. Yeah, it's right around the same time. The United States government is uh, getting leery of the Soviet Union at that time, the Soviet Union, and their research into psychic experimentation. A great book, you can still find it, I think, called uh, Psychic Secrets Behind the Iron Curtain. I read it as a kid. So the United States government is thinking, well, geez, if the Russians are spying on us through psychic awareness, maybe we've got to up our game. Maybe we need to have our own version. And voila, they decide that they're going to create it, and it's called the Stargate Project. And it starts out in Fort Meade in 1978, and it's carried out by the DIA. But they need somebody, they need people to kind of run this thing. Where do they go? SRI, Stanford Research Institute. And they hire two guys. They hire Russell Targ and Hal Putoff. And Russell Targ and Hal Putoff are running essentially psychic experiments, psychic experimentation um, at Stanford. So they create this project, and it goes by various names, Gondola Wish, Grill Flame, Center Lane, Sunstreak, Scan 8, and then in 1991, it gets christened, uh, rechristened the Stargate Project. So this is uh, from Wikipedia, Stargate Project were primarily involved remote viewing, the purported ability to see psychically, uh, psychically see events, sites or information from a great distance. The project was overseen until 1987 by Lieutenant Frederick Holmes, Skip Atwater, an aide and psychic headhunter to Major General Albert Stubblebein. And I think uh, Stubblebein, he's he's married to, what's her name? The crazy, the crazy medical gal. Anyway, uh, and later president of the Monroe Institute. The unit was small scale, comprising about 15 to 20 individuals. It was run out of old leaky wooden barracks. The Stargate project was terminated and declassified in 1995. The CIA report concluded that it was never useful in any intelligence operation, of course. Would they have an investment and say, yeah, it was really useful? Uh, the program, of course, becomes uh, turned into a movie, The Men Who Stare at Goats, which a lot of people have seen. 
they turn it into comedy, satire, right? And they demystify it. At first they declassify it, then they demystify it. In the 70s, uh, psychologists, parapsychologists Russell Targ and Hal Putoff began testing psychics for SRI in 1972, including one who would later become an international celebrity, Israeli Uri Geller. Uri Geller has, um, he has, he has gifts. Uri Geller is a very interesting human. Uh, their apparently successful results garnered interest with the Department of Defense. Ray Hyman, professor of psychology at the University of Oregon, was asked by Air Force psychologist uh, Lieutenant Colonel Austin Keebler, who is the uh, director of behavioral research, uh, for ARPA to go to SRI and investigate. So essentially, this whole project of remote viewing and psychics and super soldiers starts at Stanford, starts at SRI, starts with the psychic research created by Targ and put off. Okay, so these are these are tracks, parallel running tracks, right? You have you have values and lifestyles and psychographics, and you have psychic research and Project Stargate, which results in Girl Flame, and to some extent even the Super Soldier program. So this is all happening at Stanford. Okay, so can you see some of these connections here? I mean, these are these are major social movers in a lot of ways. Now you've got all these remote viewers out there teaching how to remote view and becoming part of the mainstream consciousness. Well, it's mainstream at some point, right? Again, it's not while all this is going on, but in, in terms of the evolution, the process of evolutions, uh, something else emerges out of Stanford and the Stanford Research Institute. One of the guys that was hanging around Stanford during that time was a guy by the name of Willis Harmon. And Willis Harmon was known as a futurist. He was somebody who was invested in the future. And Harmon was um, rumored to be one of these guys that takes uh, psychedelics. And he was, he was a tripper, but he was an older, older guy. Uh, Willis W. Harmon. And there's a connection between Harmon and IONS, the Institute of Noetic Sciences. And they created this report for SRI, the Stanford Research Institute. And I strongly, 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 strongly advocate that people look at this document that I'm about to share with you. And I've talked about it on the show before. It is called Changing Images of Man. And it was prepared by the Center for the Study of Social Policy at SRI, Stanford Research Institute. And the subtitle, it's edited by uh, O.W. Markley and, of course, Willis Harmon. And the subtitle of it is Systems, Science, and World Order Library, Explorations of World Order. Uh, it is a thousand volume original paperback library in aid of education. That's the uh, Pergamon International Library. This is where this book is. It's in the Pergamon International Library. Changing Images of Man. Changing Images of Man. One of the, one of the people that was involved in the uh, writing of this book, this report, is Joseph Campbell. And you can find this online. It's actually pretty, uh, it's a pretty heady book, a heady report. Let me read you some of the quotes here that they start off with. This is from Youth Thant, whom I believe was the head of the UN at one point. I do not wish to seem overdramatic, but I can only conclude from the information that is available to me as Secretary General that the members of the United Nations have perhaps 10 years left in which to subordinate their ancient quarrels and launch a global partnership to curb the arms race, to improve the human environment, to diffuse the population explosion, and to supply the required momentum to development efforts. If such a global partnership is not forged within the next decade, then I very fear, then I very fear, then I very much fear 
that the problem I have mentioned will all have reached such staggering proportions that they will be beyond our capacity to control. And that was in 1969. But it's part of this forward. Um, Huxley, Julian Huxley says in 1968, much advanced both in biological evolution and in psychosocial evolution, including advanced in science, is of course obtained by adding minute particulars, but at intervals something like crystallization from a supersaturated solution occurs as when science arrives in an entirely new concept, which then unifies an enormous amount of factual data and ideas, as with Newton or Darwin. Major advances occur in a series of large steps from one form of organization to another. In our psychosocial evolution, I believe we are now in a position to make a new major advance. So 1968 is really the precipice of the new age. And there are other people that, uh, here we go, here's the core research. I'm going to give you the core researchers. Dwayne Elgin, who is a big, 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 big proponent of the uh, austerity and simplicity uh, program and agenda. Uh, Small is Better, I think, is one of the books he wrote. Willis Harmon, Arthur Hastings, O.W. Markley, Dorothy McKinney, Brendan O'Regan, major contributions were made by Joseph Campbell and Floyd Madsen, and less extensive ones by Magora Marayuma, Donald Michael, Leslie Schneider, Barbara Pillsbury, and John Pyatt. The report was edited by Susan Taylor and Shirley Mann, and numerous insights acknowledged in the text came from investigators at other centers. The big players in here are Willis Harmon, Joseph Campbell, and Dwayne Elgin. Now, what this document has inside of it, and again, I, I seriously suggest you find this thing and read it, is basically the, it's the spine of Agenda 21. It is the spine of Agenda 21 and uh, Agenda 2030. And what it does is it gets into the images of man in the changing society. Uh, some of the bullet points that they go through, I'm not gonna go through all of them, uh, indications of perception and behavior influenced by images. Uh, clinical data from psychotherapy indicated that life shaping effect of an individual self image. Anecdotal data relating to behavioral changes induced by self image change following plastic surgery. Uh, studies of effects of teacher expectations and student performance. I mean, this is very, very detailed stuff. Hypnosis research demonstrating the influence of suggestion induced images and expectations. Athletic coaching practices utilizing deliberate alteration expectations of self-image, on and on and on and on. What, what is inside of this report basically is a primer for getting people on board with a global civilization in using things like the environment, using things like crisis, using things like a broad spectrum potential for uh, syncretic beliefs and faiths, meaning that there is a, a new kind of spirituality that can emerge and needs to emerge as a result of the, the sort of the change in topography and landscape and getting people to think more about group and more about future and less about self and now. And it's a really fascinating uh, document and it's, it goes into extremely great detail. Uh, number 38, changing images of man, mind versus matter. Are we essentially mind, consciousness, or spirit? Or are we composed of physical matter alone, a construction in whom life and thought is but a characteristic of the state of organization of the material? Most cultures have seen the human as essentially spiritual. Only with the rise of objective science has the materialistic emphasis developed. Mortal versus immortal. Some images have death as the end of the individual experience. Others hold that a person has a soul or spirit. So this goes into, again, really great detail. But ultimately, ultimately, it is created, this, this, this text is created to figure out how to change our perception of ourselves, how to change our perception of humanity, and what it's going to take in order for that to happen. So this comes out of Stanford Research, Research Institute. And I highly recommend, if you have not looked at this uh, content, 
to, to find it. There, there are free versions of it. Some of it's kind of hard to get through. But if you spend some time with it, you'll be blown away. Trust me on this. But this is really the codec of Agenda 2030 and Agenda 21. And where does it come out of? Stanford. Stanford University. Uh, so now we're not quite done with Stanford, though. And even though the show's going on a little bit longer, there's so much to share. What else comes out of Stanford? More contemporary. Google. Google comes out of Stanford. And it's, Google was incubated by Stanford, right? That's what happened. And what does Google do? Well, Google is the engine. It is, it is like the CERN of psychographics because it's scraping data all the time, right? It's always scraping data. It's not just giving you search results. That's part, you know, that's, that's just part of like, you know, the, 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 the economic trade-off. We're going to give you the search results and we're, and now we're, they're actually tailoring search results. I mean, you can do the same search for the same thing in two different locations on two different computers and you'll get two different sets of parameters coming back to you. And Google is now in the uh, business of censoring uh, news and filtering news. It's true. Um, and I know this for a fact because it was about, I don't know, two months ago, I was looking for this article about this guy who was living in New York and he was busted because he'd shot himself. And, uh, and so the cops were at his place and they found all these guns and you know, all this literature and spray can turns out the guy was was uh, vandalizing an area of New York City and he was spreading anti-semitic hateful messages turns out that the guy was of course Israeli and Jewish and the people were scratching their heads why what's going on I don't know well the reason he was doing this because he was he was an agent then I tried to, I, I, I searched this on Google. I couldn't find it. I, I could not find it. And I went to DuckDuckGo and I put in a few parameters. There it was on the first page. So this is what's happening with Google. So Google comes out of Stanford. And Stanford uh, invested in Google. How much money do you think Stanford made out of Google? A lot of money. Sergey and Brynn were there at Stanford. And uh, Sergey and Brynn and Larry Page were there at Stanford. So Google comes out of Stanford. Which becomes again this huge psycho uh, psychometric driver for our time. And this is a personal side as we begin to wind down this. And, and this is very, you know, I'm, I'm just giving you the low hanging fruit. It's, there's plenty of other information out there. But Stanford seems to be a really, really important hub when it comes to altering consciousness, public awareness, in driving, you know, where this reality matrix is going. Of course, there are other MI6, Tavistock, and Harvard, and University of Virginia. I mean, there are other places, right? But Stanford plays this really pivotal role from really the 1960s onward into the realm of cybernetics, AI information capture. Oh, and Ray Kurzweil, Hello. Now works for Google, and Google, of course, is one degree of separation from Stanford. So probably the next Stanford influence will be in AI, VR, and what happens next, the, the, the next form of the wonderful social evolution paradigm. But the, here's an aside as we wind down today. Back in uh, 2006, uh, a good friend of mine, Stephen Kent, was playing didgeridoo at Stanford and opening for the Dalai Lama. So I was part of that. I was helping out Stephen with his music at the time. And I got to spend a couple of days on the Stanford campus. And not just spend days on the Stanford campus, but I was shown around by this guy who was running uh, programs at that time. And he said to Stephen and I, he said, basically Stanford is Langley West. He said, this place is crawling with spooks. And he just said it as an aside. And we didn't really talk much about it after that. But coming from the director of programs, it underscores kind of what I'm talking about, that there is a larger sort of driver, an engine at Stanford that is 
seeding our culture in in very specific ways, uh, and it's been doing this since the 1960s. And that includes the Hoover Institute, which is this conservative think tank and part of uh, the Stanford apparatus. Anyway, I just thought it would be interesting to do a little research today and get into this whole Stanford topic so that you are a little more informed. I, I uh, really hope that you look down, change, look out a changing images of man and uh, find it on the internet and check it out. Check it out. Um, it's a very, very fascinating uh, work. And you can see that there's, you can see Campbell's fingerprints all over this thing. Let me read you another little piece here. Uh, this is, um, man also had a collectivist image of the person during the Middle Ages. Each citizen, serf, or priest, or knight knew his place in the hierarchy of church and feudalism, and all emotions were channeled in community and religious ceremonies. With the Renaissance and the Reformation came a new belief in the power and dignity of the individual. There arose a new confidence that a person could overcome problems and forge a life by his or her own efforts and by following the promptings of one's own conscience. Then they have secular progress and natural law and man as master. This is, again, super fascinating. Go check it out. Changing Images of Man, basically becoming the, the spine, the playbook for Agenda 2030, Agenda 21. Well, this is Robert Phoenix, and you've been listening to the uh, Thursday edition, Thursday edition of 15 Minutes of Flame. We'll be back here tomorrow uh, for a, a longer, maybe I should have saved this for the Friday forecast, but it was just right there. It was just right on the front burner, and I just wanted to grab it. So you know the drill. Use your head to discern what's real and your heart to say open what's possible. I'm Robert Phoenix. We'll be back uh, a little over 24 hours from today. All right. Have a great day.